Now we are moving on to phylum chordata. So we're still in the animal kingdom, and now we're talking about those with um, certain features that we would not see uh, in our invertebrate worms and in our phylum periphera or in Adaria. So in order to be in this phylum, um, there are several features, and you almost always see them most in their embryos. As different organisms uh, grow to adulthood, they may lose certain features. Um, but here are just some examples. There's a zebrafish, a chicken, and a human um, at different stages of their embryonic development, um, but they do have a similar shape and have some similar features that put them in this phylum. Okay, so to be in phylum chordata, um, there are only 5% of the animals on Earth that belong in this phylum. Um, so even though they uh, aren't numerous and various, they are some of the more advanced animals, and you'll recognize that. So to be in this phylum, you have to have four characteristics at some point in time in your lifespan. The first is what we call a notochord. That is just the longitudinal flexible rod that's made up of collagen. And that's what in, in our vertebrates becomes the vertebral column. Otherwise, it can um, wrap around what we call the dorsal nerve cord, which is our next feature. So here we go, the single hollow dorsal nerve cord. That's what becomes the brain and the spinal cord. So that's what makes this particular phyla much more advanced. So what happens when our nerve cord um, is exposed and the notochord doesn't completely encase it? Well, spina bifida is that condition in humans. So babies can be born with spina bifida. And the problem with having your nerve cord exposed like that is um, without that proper development, it, those nerves can become damaged because they're not protected. Um, and it causes all kinds of problems. It, it's not always a fatal disease, it just depends on the amount of exposure. Um, I have certainly met people who have had it and they are perfectly well-functioning adults, um, but in severe cases it can cause death um, in babies, so that's one condition. So our third and fourth features. Um, the third is the pharyng pharyngeal pouches. These are slits near the pharynx um, that either develop into gills or tonsils and the parathyroid glands in humans. Uh, it really just depends on which animal we're talking about. And the fourth is that post-anal tail. And it can either stay a, stay a tail or it can become reduced and um, be reabsorbed like it is in humans. So like I said, these are four things that are found at some point in development among the organisms that are in phylum chordata. They're not all present in the adult form. Okay, so who's in this phylum chordata? These are the different things we're going to be looking at. The first are our non-vertebrate chordates. Um, so before we start getting a vertebral column, there are organisms that have that um, cord still, uh, nice and flexible, but they, they don't develop vertebrae. And then um, everything down after that, those are our vertebrates. We have fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. So we'll be looking at those as well. So just so you can see where we are right now, um, we are looking at everything that has a notochord, that common ancestor is true for um, all of these organisms. Um, and we're gonna start right here with our non-vertebrates. So we have a notochord in the adults, and then note that everything up this way um, starts having vertebrae, but we're gonna start with our non-vertebrate chordates. Okay, here we go, non-vertebrate chordates. Um, we're gonna look at three different classes, and so first of all, thing to notice is that um, all of these are living in a marine environment still. Um, so they're mostly, I think, Actually, I think all of these are filter feeders as well. So we're going to look at class Acidaceae, class Thalassaea, 
and class lepto leptocardii. Um, and our the one on the very left and the one on the very right um, are both going to be benthic animals. So what benthic means is within the substrate or the bottom of the marine environment. Okay, so think about like the seafloor or in a lake in that bottom layer. And then the class Thaliaceae, sorry, Thaliacea, gosh, I can't talk today. Um, those are organisms that live within the water column. They are not benthic. So beginning with our class Acidiaceae, um, as an adult, they no longer have a notochord or, um, or the dorsal nerve cord or a post-anal tail. Um, so, but they do have all that at some stage of their life in their embryonic development. Um, and these are solitary organisms. They don't live in a colony. Um, and they have um, an outside that's called a, a tunic, a rubbery tunic that allows it to attach to a substrate, because remember these are filter feeders. And because of that rubbery tunic, often um, their common name is called tunicates. So what it does have as its remainder of those four features is the, uh, for, is the pharyngeal slits, and it's developed that into what's called a pharyngeal basket. And that is how these filter feeders work. So living in the water, attached to a substrate because of its tunic. Um, it begins by pulling water into what it's called its buccal siphon. And as water comes through, um, it filters through these pharyngeal baskets. And then the excess water is going to come out the atrial siphon. Now, in the meantime, of course, um, all of the debris that's collected does go in and get digested. And then as it travels through, extra waste is brought back out here to go out with the outflowing water through the atrial siphon. It's a very simple organism, but it's efficient. It works well in its environment. So here's just another sample of that. And the one on the left is a tunicate that you can, um, like an actual tunicate. So that's what it looks like. The uh, pharyngeal basket is extremely um, obvious. <laughs> and um, so here we have the buccal siphon and the atrial siphon. So this is what it looks like in person. Um, again, the pharyngeal basket's very obvious on these. Okay, let's look at our class Acidiaceae in its compound form. We've already looked at it in its solitary form. Now let's look at it in the compound form. So what that means is that they have, they work together um, sort of in a colony and they have a common atrial siphon. So all this right here is going to come out like that. Um, and then they have multiple buccal siphons. So all this water coming in, again, we still have the pharyngeal baskets, and then one common atrial siphon. So looking at reproduction um, within this class, and also, I guess, in um, our tunicates as well, it can do two different things for, for reproduction. It can bud and produce reproduce asexually in that sense, or it can go through sexual reproduction. And the way that happens is um, the sperm and egg are just broadcast throughout the water, and then uh, as they meet, then the embryo develops, and of course that includes all four stages of, uh, with the chordate characteristics. And then the free-swimming larva settles down, and then it attaches to its substrate and matures into a mature ascidian. So that's how that works. It can either be asexual or sexual reproduction. So here's uh, sort of what it looks like in that process. Uh, we have our free swimming larvae that we talked about. Um, once we've had the broadcast of the sperm and egg and they come together and cause a larvae to form, this is what it looks like. It has its pharyngeal basket. Um, it has its dorsal nerve cord and its notochord. 
and then um, it has its tail right here and then it attaches and then goes through a metamorphosis until it gets to the adult stage where really the only thing left is a pharyngeal basket right here. Okay, so another class is class Thaliaceae. These are what we call the sea salps. I think these are so cool. They're part of the phytoplankton, so they're very small, um, and they are relatively clear. If you're looking at them here, you can see it's they're, they're pretty see-through, um, but they stay within the water column. And so this is just the anatomy of a sea salp. Again, very similar to the tunicates, but it doesn't have that rubbery tunic. So um, again, the buccal siphon and an atrial siphon, so filter feeders. And then they have these muscular bands. They're a little easier to see over here on the right. Um, those muscular bands allow for contraction so that the sea salp can um, move through the water column. And that allows more water to go in through the buccal siphon. So it has this pharyngeal basket, and that's where we filter out organic material. And here's its gut so that we can digest. And then excess waste and excess water come back out the atrial siphon. Reproduction in salps can either be sexual or asexual. Um, here on the left, we have our developing buds. And I, so here's these tiny little row of sea salps. There's each one individually. And so you may see them on the beach sometimes. Uh, a lot of people will say, oh, those are octopus eggs. Um, not always, no. Um, so this is what they look like, and they have a protective gelatinous layer to make sure that they don't dry out so much. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our class Leptocardii. And their common name is called a lancelet because their shape really does look like a lancelet. Um, again, they are benthic, so they will stick part of their body within the sea floor. And they are filter feeders. Mm -hmm. And as adults, they actually have all four chordate characteristics. So that's um, a little bit different from our sea salps and um, tunicates and sea squirts. So if we look here at our diagram, here we have our pharynx and the notochord and the dorsal nerve cord, and then um, our postanal tail. We're going to be looking at these in lab, and a lot of people are going to get confused between the notochord and the dorsal nerve cord. Um, the easiest thing to remember is because it says dorsal nerve cord, that is going to be uh, more dorsal to the notochord, okay? So more towards the outside. Um, okay, and then we have our gill slits because that's the way um, this particular organism breathes. So we're gonna be looking at that as well. So this is the first time in our phylum chordata that we've seen all four chordate characteristics in the adult version. So here we go. Um, this is just to show you it has a complete digestive system, meaning it has basically two um, orifices. So the water enters through the mouth and the gills and goes all the way through its digestive system and exits through the anus. And here's our lovely lancelet just to show you that is what it's named for. So a common name is lancelet. Okay, so we have talked about our um, tunicates and our lancelets right here. And those were um, part of the chordates. Now, what else is a part of the chordates but starts to branch off a little bit is um, our vertebrates. And that's going to encompass all of the rest of these right here. So let's talk a little bit about vertebrates.
Okay, so obviously they're all going to be chordates still, but now we have additional features that make them unique. So they're going to have a vertebral column, they're going to have a skull because they're going to have larger heads, they're going to have an endoskeleton. So we've looked before at some of our invertebrates had exoskeletons. Now we have endoskeletons with paired appendages and internal organs. So this is a wide variety of organisms. So I kind of tried to pick some samples to show you everything from humans to fish to moose um, to tortoises. This is a very large um, variety, but keep in mind that because they're chordates, there are only 5% of animals that make up chordates and then even less that make up vertebrates. So what happens to the notochord during the development of the vertebrae? Okay, so let's take a look at this panel here. Here we have our neural tube, which is going to be our dorsal nerve cord, right? And here's our notochord. Well, as we reach, um, as we start surrounding um, our nerve cord with vertebrae, this notochord makes up part of the vertebrae. And that vertebrae has um, the arch, here are the ribs that attach to it, the body of the vertebrae, and um, in here is where our dorsal nerve cord lies. So that notochord becomes part of the vertebrae. So the vertebrates also have a skull, um, mostly because they have a, a much more enlarged brain and it needs to be protected. So there's such a variety in the way that skull looks, so that's kind of why I put some of these out here. And um, note that these are all the same organisms that I had on that first slide with the vertebrae. So we have our moose skull with its lovely huge rack attached to it, uh, the fish, the tortoise, um, and the human skull as well. Okay, and then here we have our endoskeleton. And I know some of you are preparing for PA school, so you probably actually know more about this subject than I do. Um, but just wanted to highlight a few things. One, we have paired appendages. Um, we haven't had a whole lot of that before. Um, and then just as a reminder that our bones are not just solid features, they are a living tissue. Um, so I brought that up in the bottom left just to point that out because I think um, for those who are not in anatomy and physiology, it tends to be one of those things that you think of, oh, it's just a hard structure. Um, and it's not, it's living tissue. Okay, so the other part of being a, being a vertebrate is that you have internal organs. So we have a very large colon. Um, it has a complete digestive tract and we have a closed circulatory system. We keep kind of mentioning that here and there. Um, I did put an article on Sakai for you, uh, open circulatory systems versus closed circu circulatory systems. For your purposes here, you're gonna need to know that a closed circulatory system means that it uses blood to transport um, oxygen and or gases and nutrients and it's all contained within blood vessels um, instead of dumping it out into a cavity. Um, more internal organs, we have respiratory organs, excretory organs, and sexual organs. So all of those are part of being a vertebrate. What's gonna be fun is that we're gonna to get to go into each of these um, different groups of vertebrates, uh, our fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. It's actually a lot of fun. So we're gonna kinda of go through those um, in the next couple lectures and look at what unique features they bring to the table, how they may be adapted for their living environment, and um, just unique features there. We'll see you next time.